we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 22, which is the final chapter of Revelation, and it's also the final chapter of the Bible. And we're going to go ahead and read chapter 22, and as we do, we're going to go through verse by verse and try and understand and exposit what's being said in this final chapter of the Bible. So we'll make a start. Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things, and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto ye these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, from which, sorry, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So, as we've read, there are several key subjects of Revelation 22. We have out here in eternity the New Jerusalem and the waters of life, the tree of life. And we have a final warning and admonition to the reader. But we'll make a start with verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So from this verse we see that there's a river of water of life proceeding out of the throne of God. The Lord will be sat upon his throne. And this is where this river will originate from. And this water is the water of life. And we read of this in Revelation 21 and verse 6, which says this, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. So he's going to give this water freely. And he being the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, we see God's grace out in eternity. And the fact that he gives this water freely, the Lord, shows that this water is a gift. It's not a loan, it's not something that you need to pay back. And how exactly will this water of life interface with the tree of life out in eternity? 
of that I'm not sure. But we see here um, an interesting parallel to John chapter 4 and verse 10. We've been here before, the woman at the well caught in adultery. John chapter 4 verses 10 and also verses 13 and 14. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. In verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So in the context of this verse, the Lord is talking about eternal life as the, as the water that only he can give that will satisfy forever. But we'll um, continue on in our study. This water, which is proceeding out from the throne of God, it will be the purest water that you could possibly imagine. It's going to be a river that is breathtakingly beautiful. Turn to Psalm 36. Psalm 36, verses 7 to 9. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. We put our trust in the Lord. We ask him to cover us, to put us under the shadow of his wings, to protect us and keep us safe. Verse 8. And they, sh that sh they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light shall we see light. We also turn to Psalm 65, and verse 9. Psalm 65 and verse 9. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it, thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn, when thou hast so provided for it. That's the river of God in that verse. And you can imagine the nature and greenery on the banks of this river. It's going to be spectacular. And if you're saved, you'll, you'll have uh, all eternity to paint it, I'm sure. And on a personal note, I find rivers to be one of my most favourite things out in nature. I love the sound of the flowing waters. And as an ex-rower, I've spent many, many hours rowing boats up and down a number of rivers here in England. The River Tees, the River Wire, the River Ewes, and the River Tyne, just to name a few. The Avon in Stratford-upon-Avon, where I live, is a beautiful river. And I find it a very peaceful place to walk along down in the evenings. Even toward Wor Worcestershire, you've got the River Severn, which is also beautiful. But none of these rivers will even compare to this river of life proceeding out from the throne of God. And again, we think about waters on the earth, there's this water cycle, and we know that from science, water cannot be created or destroyed today. It's rather fascinating. You can freeze it, you can boil it, you can displace it, but you cannot create water or destroy it. All rivers have a beginning point and an end point, either being the sea or a lake or an underground spring. And again, we see here how these waters of life, they originate from God in verse 1 of Revelation 22. He himself is creating these waters. He alone is the source. Just as you know, we know evolution is false because they teach us that life can come from non-life, we know that all life originates with God. All things originate with God. Anything else is scientifically impossible. But we'll continue with verse 2. In the midst of the streets of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we read about in the midst of the street of it. I believe that's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. And on either sides of this river you have the tree of life. And this is the tree which God stopped Adam and Eve from getting their hands on after the fall in Genesis 3, 21 and 22. I'll just quickly go there. Genesis 3, verses 21 and 22. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. 
And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So God, he did not want mankind to live forever in a fallen state. So he had to intervene and to cast Adam and Eve out of his garden before any further damage was done. We know that the fall of man alone has had untold consequences for all of mankind. And for man to gain eternal life in a fallen state would be undoubtedly very bad. And so moving on to Revelation 22, and verse 2, this tree of life, it has 12 types of fruits on it, and 12 manner of fruits. And again, this lines up with the 12 months of the year and the 12 nations out in eternity and also the 12 tribes of Israel and it says here that the leaves were for the healing of the nations I'm not sure that anyone knows for sure what this part of the verse 2 is referring to but we know that the Gentile nations they're going to enter into the heavenly Jerusalem out in eternity from Revelation 21 and verse 24 and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, so the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it. They're going to do that to worship the Lord and to partake of the fruit of this tree, should they be obedient to God. And again, perhaps this verse is referring to this tree's significance to mankind in the future. If you're obedient to God's commandments and the Lord allows you to partake of the fruit of this tree, you'll have eternal life and perfect fellowship with your Creator. Moving on to verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So to me this speaks of the sin curse being lifted from man. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God cursed several things. Turn to Genesis 3.14. Genesis 3.14. God cursed the serpent. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. The serpent was to go on its belly and to eat dust. God also cursed women in Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So, women were cursed with pain and childbearing and also subjection to their husbands. He's cursed the ground in Genesis 3.17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So we know the ground has been cursed, it's nowhere near as fertile as it once was, and it requires constant maintenance. Think of the, the weeds and the pests that consume all of the crops. The ground requires constant work. Agriculture is very dif difficult. And he's also cursed work in verse 19, Genesis 3:19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So work, we must all work until we die, and even if you retire with a, a big pension and all the rest of it, you will still be working to maintain your possessions and your wealth. Everything requires maintenance, and there will always be jobs that need doing. So this curse that man has been under for so long, God one day is going to lift it, finally. And at the end of verse 3, in back in Revelation 22, And his servants shall serve him. His servants shall serve him. That's you and I, if we're saved, if we're born again. We'll be doing whatever God wants us to do, and we'll have perfect peace and, and happiness in doing so. Moving to verse 4, and I'll read that now. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. So we, the saved, we're going to see God's face. Contrast this with 1 John. 1 John 4, 2. 
Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Uh, apologies, I am in, need to be in 1 John 4.12. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. So no man hath seen God at any time. So to see God, to see his face out in eternity is going to be an, an incredible privilege. And again, we know from Exodus 33 and verses uh, 30 that nobody can look upon the face of God and live today. Sorry, not verse 30, verse 20. Exodus 33 and verse 20. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, this is the Lord speaking, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I, sh I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. God had to protect Moses when he passed by. And I believe that we'll also have a new name in heaven because of this verse. And we'll have the Lord's mark in our foreheads. Again, we know that Satan, he counterfeits this mark with the mark of the beast. Down here in the tribulation period, with this mark, this microchip, or whatever it's going to be in the forehead. He certainly knows the scriptures very well indeed. Back to Revelation 22 and also verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither the light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So we've read back in Revelation 21 and verse 23 about how there'll be no need for the sun, the moon, lights, lamps and torches out in eternity, as God himself shall be our light. And again, this is emphasised within this verse. It says, it says also that they shall reign forever and ever. We're looking forward to an eternity of joy, peace, perfect health, no loneliness, no pain or tiredness, no stress, no worries about money, bills, mortgages, loans, car payments and rent. There'll be no sin in ourselves and no sinful desires. There'll be no sinful people to deal with. There'll be no constant government and media propaganda to have to put up with. And I for one cannot wait for this day. And this time will go on forever and ever finally fit in, to finally be somewhere where you belong with the Lord in his city. Moving to verse 6, and he said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. His sayings are faithful and true. So as sure as the Lord rose from the dead and preserved his word for us to read today, so are these promises true. The Lord himself, he's called faithful and true, back in Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And again, back to the verse, uh, verse 6 in Revelation 22. So we know the Lord's called faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which, which must shortly be done must shortly be done. We'll be in eternity very soon indeed. Our lives are incredibly short when you think about it. And of course the lost world lives in denial about this. The lost world, they plan as if they're going to live down here forever. And that's why they're so ob obsessed with houses and investments and health and fitness. But all of these things, they're going it's a fleeting thing is life. You'll never be able to quite grab a hold of all these things that you're chasing after for long. I suppose you don't understand it really when you're younger, but time really does seem to speed up, or your perception of time does certainly, as you get a little bit older. Turn to Job. We'll go to Job chapter 7, and verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Of course, that's the condition of the lost. They're spent without hope, but we know we have hope. Moving on to verse 7. 
Behold, I come quickly. That's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is returning very soon indeed. He is coming for us at the rapture of the church, spoken of in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. I love going there. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. If the Lord tarries, and if we're not caught up at the rapture, if he takes his time according to his will, then we'll certainly meet him at death. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And as well, going back to Revelation 22 and verse 7. So the Lord is coming quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So if you keep the words of this book, be it the book of Revelation or even the Bible itself, you're blessed of God according to this verse. And if you, like these modern theological scholars do, if you change the book of Revelation, if you spiritualise all of its meaning, if you make it one big metaphor, if you teach um, amillennialism, it's all already happened. If you twist the scriptures, you're going to not receive the blessing of God. You'll be left in darkness. And what Christians who subscribe to these false doctrines, what they must be thinking about the world today, if they truly believe that, you know, they've replaced Israel, you know, along the lines of replacement theology, and if they believe that they're bringing in the kingdom, if they're looking at the world today and seeing all of the apostasy and all of the sin and all of the, the wickedness and this new world order coming to rise, what they must be thinking, uh, it must be quite depressing, really. And I bet many of these so-called believers have fallen away over the past year due mainly to their pride and lack of interest in properly studying the Bible. It's a great shame that what you believe shapes you and doctrine is the most important thing really in the Christian life. From what you believe about doctrine, from your, the doctrines that you get from the Bible, the King James Bible I must say, they'll determine how you act and how you live your life. And that's why we kick against these new versions that change the word, that twist certain scriptures, which completely alter the meanings of the, of the doctrines, and we really must reject these so-called Bibles. Moving on to verse 8. And I, saw, and I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Once again, we've touched upon this theme of God's servants refusing worship when we studied Revelation 19 and verse 10. Revelation 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that of the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. God's servants be they angels or men, they never accept worship. And again, this is in direct contrast to Satan, who loves worship, and I suppose that's his goal today, to, to be worshipped by men. Turn to Luke 4, 7. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. That's Satan talking to the Lord Jesus Christ, back in his temptations out in the wilderness. But we know that people, according to Revelation 13 and verse 15, if I just quickly go there as well, we're covering a lot of scriptures today. Revelation 13, 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We know that Satan's antichrist and his, and his, and his image, they're going to receive worship one day. And it's even in the grander scheme of things, his servants today in organised religion and in the media, they certainly love worship, don't they? Think of all these celebrities and um, all these religious figureheads, obviously the Pope being the biggest who loves to receive worship. But we know that God's real servants, they never accept worship. And this angel, back in Revelation 
22 and verse 8, and also verse 9, he refuses the worship of the Apostle John. I can imagine that the Apostle John is so overwhelmed with what he's seeing that he can't help but fall down, but the angel he has sent enough to refuse the worship. And we know that all worship belongs to God. Verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not? For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Again, if you read the Ruckman Reference Bible, Dr. Ruckman, he has an interesting theory, I suppose, about this angel. And he states in his notes that this angel could have once been a man who was resurrected. As the angel in this verse, he says he is of his brethren, the prophets, and he doesn't give his name. And here's an interesting cross-reference on that. Turn to Matthew, Matthew 22 and verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, talking about us, but, as, but are as the angels of God in heaven. We know we'll be just like the angels out in eternity. Moving on to verse 10. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Could this angel, could he be Daniel? Sounds an awful lot like Daniel 12. Daniel 12 verses 9 and also verses 13. Daniel 12 and verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of the time. Sorry, till the time of the end. And verse 13. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the, of the days. We know Daniel was saved and his, he was to be resurrected. And perhaps this angel is Daniel in his resurrection body. But who knows? And we know that this book is not to be sealed. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And again, that's being said in the context of eternity. In eternity, it'll be time for these events to play out, to unfold. But back in Daniel's day, in chapter 12, he was told that the words of the book were sealed until the time of the end. It wasn't, it wasn't God's uh, timing to carry out the things that were written therein, but out in the future... And we know this is where the events of Revelation and of Daniel's prophecies, we know this is where they'll play out. That's all to come. Verse 11, Revelation 22 and verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So... Just from this verse alone, verse 11, I suppose as instruction in righteousness for us Christians, we, we choose how we want to live today. When the Lord catches us up, will we be unjust and filthy, or will we be righteous and holy? And we know the Lord is coming back very soon, and we, we must all make a choice. If we're saved, will we live for the Lord, or will we allow sin to ruin our lives and our testimonies? It's a daily battle that we all must fight and it doesn't end until we're dead. If you're lost when the Lord returns, woe betide you. It'll be too late to get saved then and it'll be too late to seek forgiveness and mercy. So we've all got a choice to make. Salvation it is the most urgent decision a person needs to make in life. And the younger you get saved, the better. And I wish I'd been saved in my early teens. It would have saved me many years of wasted time and sin and poor decision making. And I thank God that he didn't let me die during my lost life. I know I'd certainly have deserved that. But if we're saved, we're to source our lives out and to live in the expectation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially today. And I suppose today it's one of the hardest times in world history to live a pure and godly life. Think of all the manifold temptations that are out in the world. You know, cheap alcohol is in every store. There's lustful images and pornographic images everywhere. The mainstream music of our culture is littered with satanic, satanic imagery and, and lyrics. And our schools and our education systems, they force us to accept pretty much atheism as the truth. And since there's no life after death and since we've randomly evolved from monkeys... Nothing matters, so you might as well do whatever you want to do. You can sin as much as you want, waste all the time you 
want to waste and be as selfish as you like throughout life. But to reject the system, to choose the Lord and his word, you've got to be a very strong character. It is possible to live a pure and a clean life, but you've got to be very spiritually strong and disciplined. Turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 and verses 23 to 24. Psalm 37, verse 23 to 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. We're to keep fighting every day. We all fall, we all stumble. But the Lord, if we go back to him, if we ask him for forgiveness and mercy, he's going to put us back on our feet. We're to keep fighting. And there'll be so many who are unjust and filthy when the Lord does return, going back to our verse. So for ourselves, I know we've been forgiven and our sins are as far away as the east is from the west. They've been utterly dealt with at the cross of Calvary. But we're to make sure that we've got our own houses in order. If we're involved in any form of sin, be it open or secret, let's stamp it out with the Lord's help today. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I come quickly. So the Lord, he's going to be with us before we know it. And he's going to give every man according as his work shall be. So we know the lost, they're going to receive their degree of punishment in the lake of fire. And we're going to either gain or lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's going to be quite a frightful day, I do believe. But if we sort our lives out, perhaps it won't be such a bad day. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. It's going to be a terrifying day, really, to receive the bad as well as the good. Turn to Isaiah 40 and verse 10. Isaiah 40 and verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. And also Isaiah 62 and verse 11. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Amen. Going back to Revelation 22, and we'll read verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So we know the Lord, he is eternal. And we've read the phrase Alpha and Omega four times in the Bible, including in this verse. It's, it appears in Revelation 1 verse 8, Revelation 1 and verse 11, Revelation 21 6, and also in this verse here in Revelation 22 and verse 13. And a few more cross references on this turn to Isaiah, Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. And also just to just to tidy up this uh, last part of our study on this verse, we'll turn to Micah 5 and verse 2. Micah 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is going to be, sorry, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting from everlasting, certainly not from ancient times, as the New Bibles say. They like to pretty much teach that God is a created being based upon their corruption of this verse, but it's simply not true. The Lord, he had no beginning and he'll have no ending. The Lord is eternal. Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. So here we have a new dispensation beginning, and we know it's of faith and works. We've got commandments that must be done there of your works. How these modern 
scholars and even amongst you know, King James circles, they kick against this, but it's so plain to see. You must do the commandments of God to have right to the tree of life. And again, another good example is, you know, even this mark of the beast. If you take this mark of the beast out in, in the tribulation, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to the lake of fire. That's something you can do. It's a work. You've got to resist this. If you accept it, and if you don't fight against this system and you go along, you get chipped, you get this mark, you cannot be saved. And again, they defend this with pretty much a Calvinistic doctrine of, well, the uh, the elect, they're, they're not going to accept this mark of the beast. Well, I think you're really going far out there. And based upon what we've discussed before in previous studies, we can see faith and works are present throughout this tribulation period. So blessed are they that do his commandments. So we've got works that they may have rights to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So this tree of life, it was denied to Adam and Eve, as we read back in Genesis 3, verses 22 and 24. But the nations, they're going to enter into the gates of the heavenly Jerusalem as part of their worship of the Lord out in eternity, as we read of back in Revelation 21. And they'll need to do the commandments of the Lord to be allowed into this city, and then they'll be allowed to eat of this tree to gain eternal life. We know that these nations, they gain eternal life from the tree of life, or as we Christians, we gain eternal life through the tree of death, if you like, and that's the cross of Calvary. Turn to Galatians, Galatians 3.13, Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Moving on to verse 15, Revelation 22, 15. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So again, the Bible describes the people who will not be allowed into the city. We have dogs. I believe this speaks of foul and dirty people who act like animals, the unsaved. And this is typical of unsaved men. And our culture at the moment is obsessed with dogs. Most women today are more interested in their dogs than they are in, in their children or in having children. And we know the market for dog accessories, doggy daycare and grooming is worth millions and millions of pounds and dollars. It's a very weird obsession in the Bible never has anything good to say about dogs they're unclean animals for the most part so i think there's a spiritual dimension to this turn to philippians 3 and verse 2 beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of the concision turn to matthew 15 and verse 26 matthew 15 and verse 26 but he answered and said it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs the Lord's calling these Gentiles dogs. They're dirty. Turn to Matthew seven and verse six. Give not which sorry, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and, and, and turn again and rend you. I'm talking about these filthy people who hate God and reject him. Turn to Isaiah fifty six. Isaiah fifty six and verse ten. His watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Talking about those in organised religion who are neglecting their responsibilities, they're described as dogs. Turn to Psalms. Turn to Psalms. Uh, 22, Psalm 22 and verse 16, Psalm 22 and verse 16, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they have pierced my hands and my feet. This is the Lord describing those who have crucified him. And finally turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2 and verse 22. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing 
in the mire. And this is describing unsaved men who get a head knowledge of salvation but never truly get born again. So dogs, it's not a sin to have a dog of course, you can have a pet, but I think this, ob this obsession with dogs and this real elevation of pets and animals in today's society, I think it's very perverse, but we'll continue. People treat them as humans almost. For, so for without our dogs and sorcerers and sorcerers, again we have those who practice magic and witchcraft, it's rife today, if you think about all of these drugs and these new age rituals people get involved with. Even think about the mass of the Roman Catholic Church, that's a form of sorcery. Moving on. So without dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers. Whoremongers. So these are habitual fornicators. And again, this is pretty much the norm today. No commitment, no purity, no need for marriage. Just walk out on your kids whenever you please. Just cheat and lie your way through life right up until the end. We've got whoremongers outside and murderers too. Murderers. So we've got a generation of kids today who've grown up with Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto and all of these sick movies. Kids, they spend hours and hours and hours playing games when all they're doing is shooting people and killing people. And nobody bats an eyelid anymore to violence and gore. And again, it's so realistic now on these games and TV shows that it'll turn your guts and make you feel sick just watching it. And that's why these young teens are able to stab and to kill each other in these cities without a shred of remorse. And we live in a world full of murderers. We've got also outside here in verse 15, idolaters. Idolaters, and again we've touched upon this before. In the West, you know, think the USA, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe. People, they mainly worship money and pleasure. You think self-gratification, that's doing things that you enjoy, you get pleasure out of. Self-propagation, that's pretty self-explanatory. Doing things that, you know, produce more people. And self-preservation, protecting yourself. Most people, they'll never act outside of these three confines for the most part. And we'll continue with the rest of this verse. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie... Whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. We know billions, they love lies today. Think of Catholicism, atheism, evolutionism and Islam. And many have made a fortune out of Christians by lying to them. Christians who reject their Bibles, who aren't studying, who are very weak and shallow in their doctrines. They've been fleeced. You think of Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, all these prosperity preachers. Well, there'll be absolutely no sin permitted in the heavenly Jerusalem. Those who want to live in these sins will never be allowed into this city. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So this is the beginning of the final admonition or warning to those who read this chapter of the book of Revelation. We see, how, we see here of how the Lord Jesus Christ, he sent his angels to pass this message on to the churches, the literal physical churches of Revelation 1, 2 and 3, and also all of the Christians who read the scriptures. The Lord, he's talking to his churches, and verse 17 points to salvation being a free gift without works, which is indeed the case today. And it says here, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So again, the Lord being the root and offspring of David, he's referring to his lineage. The Lord Jesus Christ, he was born of David's line. Turn to Matthew 1. This is his genealogy, Matthew 1 and verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The chapter details those who are in this messianic line. And the Lord as well, he's called the bright and morning star. And this is a title of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we all know the cross-reference, Isaiah 14, verse 12, in these new versions. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Well, in the new versions, they give this title of the morning star to, to Satan. 
And again, this proves their origins and their inspiration. It's wickedness. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the bright and morning star, not Satan. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So today the Spirit of God he is convicting people of their sins and pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ according to John 16. He wants people to be saved. The bride, the church, we're very lukewarm for the most part, but it still has its members who are doing the work of an evangelist and trying to win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a free gift. He'll satisfy you for all eternity, but you alone must make that choice to Repent and believe the gospel for yourself. So, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. I'll read verse 19 as well. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So these are very frightening verses indeed. And again, there's a few theories on these verses that I've heard since I've been saved. Some will say that if you corrupt or pervert the words of God and the scriptures, you'll be damned. Some say this only applies to the book of Revelation, that if you corrupt and change the words in the book of Revelation, that you'll be damned. It says in verse 19 that you'll have your part taken out of the book of life. And to me, this speaks of going to the lake of fire. And some say that this verse is for those that corrupt the word of God during the tribulation period. But personally, I'm not sure. I know we believe in eternal security today, according to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And there are many, many more cross-references than this, but just for the sake of time. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted... After that you heard, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Once you're saved today, you're sealed with the, the Spirit. You're yeah, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're saved. You've got your eternal security. And what I will say is that if you've been involved with corrupting the word of God, with tampering with scriptures like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Catholics, these Talmudic Jewish people, the apostate theological scholars, and so on and so forth, you can be saved, be sure of that, if you believe the gospel, if you repent, if you drop your pride. But I think one thing that we're going to take away from this verse is the fact that it is a very serious sin in God's sight when people change the scriptures and try and pass it on as the word of God. For the most part, these people do not repent of their deeds. They do not come to the knowledge of the truth and believe the gospel. And yes, they will certainly be punished greatly in eternity. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And also Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And again, an interesting sort of anecdote here. If you've read Gail Ripplinger's book, uh, this New Age Bible versions, she documents cases where these Apostate Bible scholars have lost their voices and their ability to speak after publishing their new versions and trying to take people away from the authorised version. We're not to mess with the Bible under any means. Verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. And this should be our daily prayer. Come Lord Jesus. Take us away from this dying world, full of sin, full of death. Come and fix this world, Lord, because we simply cannot do it. And as this world becomes worse and worse, especially given this current situation that this whole world is in, we ought to pray 
this now more than ever. I certainly do not want to be here for much longer. The world is becoming a, a nightmare police state. And we must take encouragement from these scriptures because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be with us sooner than we even realise. We are to keep on working, watching and waiting until his timing is fulfilled. Turn to Luke 12. Luke chapter 12. Verse 39. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Verse 21. What a watch. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. The, verse 21. Sorry, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And this is the last verse in the Bible and may his grace be with us all as we all certainly need it. Amen.